don't know you guys, my name is Jackson Peer. Um, so it's nice to meet you if I don't know you. Um, but I hope I've gotten to meet most of you uh, out at, you know, out at the front. Me and Clay usually stand out there, sometimes Tanner, wherever he's at. But uh, we'll stand out there, you know, and say hi to cars. And, and you know, there's been a little bit of a, something I've been hearing about that. Some of you guys will tell me, like, bro, why do you stop us every time? Like, why? Like, I, I see, I think Lane out there, maybe Lane Winger out there somewhere. <laughs> But uh, some of you guys just drive straight past us. You're like, we're not about it. But, um, you, know, you know, I understand that. I understand that. You know, I hope if you're new, though, that it, it has helped you at some point. Like, okay, yeah, I'm at Boathouse. I know where to go. That's all good. But, you know, if you don't like it, Lane, if you don't like it, you're welcome to tell me. Um, you're welcome to tell Clay not to do it. But I, I will be offended. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll get over it. It'll be fine. But, but just know that I like to say hi to you guys. But, um, Anyway, so that has nothing to do with what we're talking about tonight. I just wanted to clear the air a little bit because, you know, I've just been, you know, just been hearing that. But I got this clicker here. Shane had some pretty good luck with it. So we're going to see if it's going to work tonight. But, but if it doesn't, Kelly, you got me. Um, but anyway, so tonight we'll be talking about relationships. All right, we've been talking about them. We've been talking about them for a while now. We started out with... Uh, we started out with Stephanie, uh, Mrs. Bice, a couple weeks ago. She, she taught us about... It was actually probably months ago... Uh, she taught us about marriage, right? She'd been married for 20 plus years, had a super successful marriage. And then Matt got up here. Y'all remember Matt? Yeah. Man, Matt taught us about the struggles of being single. and all. No, he taught us about how singleness is great and is to be used to your advantage to share the gospel, right? It's a huge gift. And then uh, we also heard Cody. Cody taught us about like friendships, relationships, and community, right? And he talked about how he's a pretty bad roommate, you know, pretty bad roommate, but a pretty good friend. I can vouch for him. He's a really good friend and I really appreciate him. Um, but then last week or two weeks ago before spring break, we finished off by hearing about dating from Lane. And uh, guys, like the Bible doesn't say a lot about dating specifically, but it says a lot about how you should treat your significant other and in your relationships. And Shane, I didn't forget about you. Your talk was awesome, but, you know, it was not really, you know, it didn't really fit in. So yeah, we'll, just, we'll just let it go. So anyway, relationships, right? I was, uh, I was on a run the other day, and, you know, I'm not trying to stand up here and act like I'm a big runner, okay? Because I, uh, I did try to start. I tried to get into it last fall, and I would, like, run some, but, but honestly, it's just super hard to stay consistent. So I'm not, like, don't get that from me, okay? I'm not like, yeah, I run all the time. But anyway, so I was on a run the other day, and uh, I live in South Tyler. And if you know, I mean, South Tyler, like, older people live there too, but there is, like, the area I live in, there's a lot of young families, so I'm just running along and, you know, enjoying my beautiful sunny day, you know, running along. And I, I see like this, these, these two people, like a husband and wife in the yard, just enjoying their day, you know, doing some yard work. And I'm like, man, like, that's so cute. Like the wife was taking out the leaves, you know, to the back and the husband was mowing. She brought him some water, you know, all while I like ran by and glanced. Like I promise this all happened. Uh, but anyway, so for real though, like they were doing yard work. Look, I was like, man, that is so sweet. And, you know, I keep running maybe just like another mile down, and I see, oops, excuse me, and I see, uh, I see these other parents, right, and they have a little son, and they're teaching him how to ride a bike, and I'm like, man, that is so sweet. Like, I just love seeing, like, young families. I love seeing that, and, like, gets me thinking. I'm like, man, I desire marriage. I think, yeah, I, I do. Like, I want to I wanna have that. I want to have, like, a wife and kids. That sounds fun. Like, I want to, I want to have someone to treasure, someone to do, like, fun things with, and, like, go and, you know, hang out, do yard work, teach our son how to ride a bike. Like, that, that's something I want, right? So we're talking about relationships. And, like, that's how you're supposed to treat your wife, right? That's how you're supposed to treat your husband, your significant other. And so tonight, my question to y'all is, you know, I'm assuming most of us in here are unmarried. So my question to y'all is, are you doing that with your spouse? Are you treating your spouse with love and commitment? Are you doing fun things with them? Are you spending your life with them? And so some of you guys are probably catching on to what I'm saying here. So I'm going to skip to this next verse here. All right. Revelation 21.2. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So this is a crazy idea, all right? This is a crazy thing that's going to happen one day. The church, us, we're all going to be married to Jesus Christ. We're going to be the bride of Christ. And before you guys get all weird on me, you know, guys are like, all right, I'm marrying a dude, like, I'm marrying Jesus, like, it sounds kind of weird, right? But, but the, the overarching theme here is intimacy. See, because marriage, marriage here is not, um, it's not the marriage that we have on earth, right? Mar earthly marriage is just a symbol of what is to come. And so we have this beautiful picture between a husband and a wife, how they treat each other, how they are to be intimate. 
But the highlight here is that Jesus is going to be going to be our groom, right? And so we're to be most intimate with him, right? And so, you know, we think genuinely, like, generally we think of like, oh yeah, marriage on earth, like, it's a sexual relationship, like, none of that, right? Okay, it's, it's a relationship with Jesus and intimacy, right? True love. And so this is going to happen, right? And I promise you guys that Jesus, the groom in this situation, right, we're the bride, he is treating you with immense love. He believes you're his prize, his masterpiece, he wants to do everything with you. He wants to have you completely. This is what Jesus says about the bride of Christ. Let's see here. Yeah, I know. We love it, dude. We love it. I'm going to hold it. Maybe that'll work. You got me, Kelly? Next verse. Okay, Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. Husbands, love your wives. All right, so Paul's talking to the Ephesians, right, about husbands, but then he makes this comparison. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present her to the church himself in splendor, without spot, wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Sorry, I'm kind of, I'm going to move this behind me. Maybe that'll help with that. Um, But anyway, so we have this beautiful picture of how Jesus thinks of us, and how he wants to present us to himself on our beautiful wedding day. And so tonight, you know, We're talking about relationships. We're not talking about our relationship with anybody in this room um, because the truth is like those those relationships are going to to fade on earth. We'll get to continue some of them in heaven, but but the truth is the only relationship that's gonna matter on this side, on the other side of eternity is our relationship with Jesus. Um, It's gonna matter most. And so the conviction for me, I'm back on my run now, okay? The conviction for me on that run was like, oh yeah, I want a wife, blah, blah, blah. Then I heard Jesus literally, like, I, I heard the Holy Spirit, like, say, like, Jackson, I hear you saying you want, to, you want to treasure a spouse. You want to do these things with a wife. But what about, what about me, like, your most intimate relationship? And so that's the topic tonight, all right, y'all? We're going to talk about treasuring Jesus Christ and cherishing him and delighting in him, finding joy in him, what that looks like. Boom. All right. So... Like any good old sermon or talk, um, you know, that you guys are used to, I got three points, and I made them all, like, basically the same words for you guys, so it's pretty much easy, you know, you can follow along. Why do we need to treasure Jesus and delight in him? How do we do that, and what should doing that produce in our lives? And so before we hop in, I want to go ahead and just pray for us, and uh, if you guys also, while you're sitting there, pray for me, um, that I will convey the scripture um, well. Lord, thank you so much for this evening, Lord, and thank you just for your beautiful word, and thank you for being a beautiful Savior. God, we love you, and we adore you. I just pray that um, as we read your word tonight, unpack it, Lord, that you would um, just speak through me, but more than anything, Lord, impact the hearts in this room to find joy in you and be fully satisfied in you, that we may glorify you and be intimate with you forever. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so also before I get started with all this, I should probably make a disclaimer here. A lot, of the, uh, a lot of the material I got tonight is from JP. You guys listen to JP? Anybody? All right. Well, I'm not talking about uh, JP. I'm not talking about Jackson Pierre, and I'm not talking about Jonathan Pakluda. I'm actually talking about John Piper. Anybody listen to John Piper? So John Piper is one of, like, my favorite Bible teachers. This man, like, he knows what it's like to, lo- like, he loves God so much. You just listen to him, and you hear how much he loves God and desires him. And so if you ever get a chance to listen to him, read any of this stuff, you're probably going to find this talk on there. You know, it's probably just a copy and paste. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but for real, his stuff is incredible. And so I could encourage you to, talk, uh, to check it out. Um, but jumping into that, man, let's we'll start on this first point. Why do we need to treasure Jesus and delight in him? What's the point? Like, why, why do we have Do we have to? Or is it an option? What's the deal here? There it is. Oh, trying to get there. Y'all, this thing, it's sometimes, okay, boom. All right, it is a command from Scripture. Sorry, it's, uh, it's getting a little hairy with this, uh, this here clicker. But we'll make it do. So this is so important because, you know, I'm kind of asking the question, do we have to? Is it necessary? But yes, like the, the answer is yes, it is a command from Scripture. Let's see what the Psalms have to say about it. Start off with Philippians here from Paul, actually. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. So that's Paul to the Philippians. Psalms 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. 
Come on. Okay. Psalm 32, 11. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. And lastly, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. So this is what my brain does, all right? So I read these scriptures and I'm like, okay, delight in the Lord, rejoice in the Lord, be satisfied in God. All right, I got this. All right, so I'm just gonna go do that and that's how I'm gonna live my life, right? Like, no, that is not like we're, we, are, we take a whole life to sanctify us, right? God is working in us for our whole lives. We don't get there immediately, and so, you know, I'm going to be honest with y'all, like, I rejoice in some other things, like some things that hurt me and are not good for me. I delight in things that are ultimately sinful and not good. And, and I'm honest, I just want to share some of those with y'all um, so that you can see where I'm coming from. Uh, oh, there we go. Rejoice, I rejoice in the Cowboys getting burnt again by Aaron Rodgers and the Packers. Man, all right, so if y'all don't know, I'm a Packers fan. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of a rough time for us right now. Actually, we're losing our entire team. Um, but it's okay because Aaron Rodgers can go ahead and move on. It's fine. Um, but, man, it just fires me up that, that the Cowboys can never beat the Packers, man. It just, like, doesn't happen, like, the last several years. So, anyway, sorry. I just had to do that. But, uh, anyway, this next one, um, you know, genuinely have rejoiced in it. Sorry, Jaylee and Leah. I'm sorry. Taylor Swift finally announced that tour, man. I have been dying to go on a Taylor Swift concert. But honestly, lately, man, some crazy stuff has been happening. Like, she's been doing some shady stuff, so we might not be going, but we'll see. I mean, I was just hyped up about that announcement. I don't know about y'all. All right, but this next one, though, I think that a lot of y'all, maybe some of those Cowboys fans out there will agree with me. Cowboys releasing Ezekiel Elliott. So, yeah, we don't want to rejoice in probably someone getting released. That's probably kind of bad. But, but, I mean, but, I mean, genuinely, we want to see Tony Pollard get a chance, right? He's kind of a beast, so we want him to get his run. Um, but, but in reality, all joking aside, guys, like, these are some things that I have, like, seriously, like, put some serious joy in, like, rejoiced in, been like, yes, you know, like. And, but, but these are just temporary things. They really mean nothing. And my point here is not, like, it's bad to be happy about this stuff. Like, you can be like, oh, yeah, you know, I love the Packers beating the Cowboys. Anybody? Okay, we got one person back there. Anyway, uh, but, but that's not bad, right? But, but, but actually what we're rejoicing in, probably some of the things that, that you're dealing with that I know I've dealt with, is that we choose to find our joy. We choose to delight in, you know, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, our friends, being involved in, in sports, grinding out for that A or maybe that C, um, partying, drinking, things that are constantly going to let us down, you know, like, honestly, one that I've dealt with is, like, I just want to, like, I want to be liked, right, and so I'll go into a room, and, like, that'll be, that, that used to be my main goal, right, and, like, is that what I'm really seeking? Is that what I'm seeking to delight in, is myself and men's opinion? It can't be that. So if we find joy in Jesus, if we rejoice in the Savior, if we find complete satisfaction in him, what do, we, what do we get? What do we get? Kind of just spoiled it. I don't know if I should click it or you should. Okay, first, perfect. Thank you for, for helping me in the front row. It allows us to live in supreme satisfaction, guys. So this is a huge deal. I don't know about y'all, but I mean, I hear that and I don't even, like, I don't even know what that means. Okay, like, supreme means, like, best, right? The, the ultimate thing. And satisfaction is like we're full. We have nothing we want, right? And so this verse talks about it. Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So we, so we read that in our Bibles. Has anybody read that verse before? You guys know that verse? Well, I've read it a couple times and guys like, to be honest, I don't think I believe that. I don't think my life has reflected that I believe in God's presence there is fullness of joy. As we just discussed, we go and we look for pleasure. We look, we look for pleasure in things that are sinful. We try to gratify ourselves. We, we look to money. We look to success in our endeavors. Like, I don't know where you guys are at. You know, like, I just graduated. So a lot of that became like, okay, I'm looking for the job. I'm looking for the best career path for me, right? And like I put, a lot of, I put a lot of satisfaction in that instead of the presence of God. And so we know these, I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard these next few uh, quotes I'm going to put up, but 
Take it from these celebrities, right, that have had everything um, worldly that you can get, right? They have the money, they have the fame, they have um, the people around them that everybody wants. So you guys have heard this Tom Brady quote, I'm sure. Why do I have three Super Bowl rings and think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey, man, this is what, I, this is what it is. I, I reached my goal, my dream. I think, man, there's got to be more than this. So that was after his third ring. And after we just saw he won his sixth, he couldn't, he couldn't stop. And he goes back and re- wins a seventh. And he's still, you know, he might even be back now because he has searched and searched for this satisfaction and never found it. One more we got up here. You guys watch How I Met Your Mother? Love that show. Ted Mosby or Josh Radnor is his real name. I didn't know that. Um, I had bought into the not uncommon notion that when I taste success, when I get over there, right, the grass is always greener over there, then I'll be happy. But, but the strangest thing happened as the show got more successful, I got more depressed. So, like, man, he had, I mean, the show was huge, right? It went on for, like, 10 seasons. Or, I don't know. It was super long. But as it went on, it, his life just got worse. And why is that? Like, why, where is their happiness? Where is their fullness of joy? Like, they, they don't have it. They're still searching, right? And maybe you're coming here tonight, like, you had a crazy spring break. I don't know. Some of you guys might have had a crazy wild spring break. And, or maybe you just started college, you know, last semester. And you thought, man, freedom for my parents. I don't have to do what they, I don't have to do what they tell me to do. I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to go do this. You know, you guys know the story. But you've done all this and, you, and you've experienced your freedom. And you just find yourself completely broken. I mean, these guys have a lot more than you do. They still find themselves completely broken, completely searching for the fountain of joy. They want to be happy. That's all they want is just to be happy. But they haven't found it. But the wonderful difference tonight between them and y'all is that you are here at Boathouse. And you are getting to worship the true God and see what it is like to live in his kingdom, right? And we're getting to read the scripture tonight and understand that true joy, fullness of joy, is found in Christ. And so tonight, man, what an opportunity to have your life never say this. And like genuinely, like I I prayed for these guys while I'm looking at these quotes, like, Lord, please let them just know you and know the satisfaction found in you. So the joy is tonight, again, that we know we've arrived at the end goal. Like I know God and I know the satisfaction in God. And for those of us in Christ, we know that. And so there's gonna be ups and downs. Like we know that there is, there is, plenty of pain and suffering on this side of eternity because we're promised it, right? But the the beautiful thing is that we know Jesus and we know fullness of satisfaction is in him. And we haven't, we don't have to keep searching. We don't have to keep being like, man, is there, is there any more than this? I mean, I got everything, but not really. So my next thing is the key here is this quote. The highest pleasure is found not merely in his God's gifts, but in God himself. I told you I was bringing out John Piper. What y'all think about that? It's pretty good. So we're not looking here. We're, we're not looking for, for gifts from God. I think we're going to sing about this in a little bit. But we don't come and, and ask God for things. We don't just want the things of God. We want his presence. And God himself is the highest pleasure. And so this is a trip of a quote. I don't know if y'all realize, but like we're about to unpack this some even more. Um, but in his presence, God himself, the person, is where our fullness of joy is. So, so this leads me into my last reason why we must delight and treasure Jesus because it's not, and again, it's not an option, right? So the last reason is glorifying to God. And so when we think about glorifying God, I mean, we think about like serving, like I'm going to go and I'm going to serve in the youth ministry, I'm going to serve in the band, I'm going to do this, I'm going to go to the food bank and do this. But guys, the most glorifying, those things are glorifying to God, but only if you're finding your joy in him. So let me explain this a little bit more, guys. It's essential to glorifying God. Having joy in him is essential, right? If we're not finding our fullness of joy in him, what's the difference between us and a non-believer doing a good work, right? They're going, you know, maybe 
Maybe, I mean, think of, think of big and powerful people like, I don't know, Bill Gates. I don't know Bill Gates' heart, but I assume that he does not know Christ because of his actions. And he gives more money probably than anybody, right? You know, these guys are out here, they're, they're raising money, they're, they're doing good for the poor, right? But is it glorifying to God? If they don't know God and they find no joy in the king, is it glorifying to God? And so tonight I propose to you that the most glorifying thing that you can do to God is to find joy in him. And so y'all wrap up for this quote. I didn't even put it on the board, all right? Just listen to this quote, okay? God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. That's John Piper's, that's John Piper's whole ministry, y'all. That he built everything on this, this biblical truth that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And so that is such a beautiful truth because you know what that means is that like we don't have to be, like we don't have to be having a bad time like out here serving God, right? While we are the most happy, the most joyful, the most satisfied, that is when God is glorified the most. That is a beautiful truth, incredible. So what, I mean, what does the Bible say about that? Is that really, is that really what the Bible says? Well, I'm about to share with y'all my favorite Bible verse, okay? I know you guys have been waiting all night. What is Jackson's favorite Bible verse? We care. You know, some of you guys probably like Jeremiah 29, 11, like, oh, God's gonna prosper me. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna have a great life, lots of money. And, you know, Philippians 4, 13, I'm gonna play sports good or whatever. No, I'm just kidding. Like, <laughs> those, those verses are really good and they are very true. Maybe a little bit taken out of context sometimes. Um, but generally, my favorite verse is Philippians 1.21. To live is Christ, to die is gain, all right? This is Paul talking in Philippians, right? But he said, to die is gain? I don't, I don't know about y'all. I first read that, I'm like, all right, so do I, am I supposed to want to die? Paul, one of the greatest Christians, wanted, is this him saying he wants to die? And it seems kind of off, right? It seems a little bit weird to read that in the scripture. But the truth is that a few verses before, he says, it's my eager expectation that Christ will be magnified in me despite whether I live or whether I die. And so how we know that the, the quote I just shared with you, I'm gonna say it again. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And so how we know that is true here from what Paul is saying is that Paul's saying, man, if I'm gonna live, I'm gonna work for God and I'm gonna, I'm gonna live as Christ lived. But to die is gain. And why is that? In the, in the hour of his greatest loss, he loves Jesus so much and wants to be with Jesus so badly that even in the hour of his greatest loss, he would view it as a gain. Is that not insane? The only thing that we really have, like the only thing that we really own is our own lives. And he said, man, if I lose that, that is a gain because I get to go, keep, go be with my king, my treasure, my favorite person, the most intimate relationship that I am in. God's most glorified us, in us when we are most satisfied in him. I want y'all to really think about that because that is a crazy statement. But praise God, just like we saw, I mean, just one example in the scripture, that is true. And so a lot of times, you know, in my early on in my Christian life, like I thought, man, laws, rules, this is hard, man. Like living for God is hard, and it is. But we get to have fullness of joy. And when we have fullness of joy, God is most glorified. And so that is a crazy, crazy, beautiful truth. So we talked about this fullness of joy, all right, wrapping up this first one. But how do we get it, all right? Like, I, I told you that it's in Jesus, right? But how do you guys live in that? How do we, you know, practically live that out, okay? So practically, first point on this, I got three words, three words. Hope it's not, okay, it's not up there yet. Three words, guys, it's about to blow your mind. All right? Might be two more, Kelly. No, <laughs> wait, it's too far. It's too far. Okay. Read your Bible. That's it. All right? Read your Bible, right? I put this slide up there, and, and I, I might have I messed it up. I don't know. It was probably on me. All right, guys. I, I, I'm all over the place right now. But that's crazy, right? Read your Bible. Okay, we've heard read your Bible, right? You guys know you need to read your Bibles. But maybe in a different way. 
Uh, I know a lot of, when I started reading the Bible when I was a kid, like, I would just read and find, like, that one verse, the application, be like, okay, I need to be kind to all people. All right, got it? I'm going to go do that. And that's what I did, right? And that, that was the end of my Bible reading. That was as far as I searched into the Scripture. But I want to propose something different to you tonight. And so um, these slides might be out of order now, so I might just leave it. But does anybody in here watch Star Wars, The Clone Wars? All right. All right, we got some hits. Not just me. I'm not the only nerd in the room. All right, that's clutch because I didn't want to feel like that. Um, but anyway, at the beginning of the show, for those of you that don't know, they have like a little, a little quote at the beginning of each episode, right? And so basically, it gives you kind of a peek into what the show is going to have, right? And so I had one, oh, sorry, again. I had one in here that was um, from this crazy episode of it that, that all you non-Star Wars nerds aren't going to care about at all. So I'm not going to talk about it. Um, but it said something like, balance is found in the one who like clears his guilt or something like that. And it's like, I don't know what that means, right? But if you, imagine if you turned on Star Wars The Clone Wars and that came up, right? That, that first line came up and you're like, all right, sounds good. And you turn the TV off. You didn't get anywhere, right? You didn't get to see the, the awesome character development that happened during the show. And this particular episode is a bunch of weird stuff about like these force gods or something. I don't know. It was really weird. Like I, I didn't really understand it, even as a Star Wars fan. But the truth is that a lot of us like in our Bible reading and like, man, I have done this for a long time. I get into the Bible. I get my application, get that one verse, and then I'm out. I'm done. But man, I didn't get to read about the story of God, the character of God, and read into the details of who God is. How are we going to know God more if we just read his law and get out? The law of God is beautiful, but man, there is so much more to be found in the word. I mean, like, open your Bible to know God more. Okay, so that was, that was the slide I was going to get to, is read your Bible to know God more. Don't just read it, y'all. There is so much to be found in the word of God. And so it was such a revelation to me when I heard this, man. It's just like, what have I been doing this whole time, man? And so now, like, I just want to encourage you guys, but now when I read my Bible is, Lord, let me know you more. Let me know you more as a result of reading this passage so that I can love you more. Because how do you fall in love with a person? Some of you guys got boyfriend, girlfriend in here? Anybody? Anybody want to confess? Okay, we got two here. Uh, oh, we got, okay. How do you get to, how do you, how do you love that person more? You get to know them more, right? You spend time with them. You know their character more. So let's see what the scripture says about God, man. He's perfectly loving, just, kind, merciful, full of grace, beautiful beyond measure, all-powerful, completely sovereign, redeeming, generous. I mean, like, literally, I could go on forever. That was just some things that, like, just came up naturally, you know? This is one verse that describes this one verse describes Jesus. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he has made. Man, that's just one verse. And I know I said, hey, don't get one verse and go, but man, that might be a good one to do that with, all right? That's fire, guys. That is literally our God that we serve. That is what the Bible says about him. And so, hey, yes, sir. All right, so, Read the Bible to know God, man. Don't just stop reading it when you get an application. And, man, and, and while I'm on this point, if you don't have a Bible, if you're here and if you're here saying, like, I, I don't even read my Bible because I ain't got one, man, please come talk to us. Like, we will give you a Bible. Lane, Clay, Beebs, like, we will give you a Bible because we know that the knowledge of God is in there and how to know God is in there. And so we want you to have that. So if you ain't got one, get one from us. And if you, if you do have one, get into it and know God more. All right. So it's not just reading our Bibles, right? There's more to living with Christ than reading our Bibles, although it is so rich and so beautiful to have. We ought to live our entire lives with Jesus. We always talk about getting up, you know, having your quiet time. Get up, read your Bible, pray, you know, get a little 15 minute in before you go to work. Awesome. I love that. Keep doing it. But your time in the presence of God does not end when you end your quiet time. All right? You're spending your entire life with Jesus. You are a child of God. This is your most intimate relationship, right? And so if you confine God to this quiet time, man, 
that fullness of joy is not going to be experienced because there's so much more. So our time with God, right, can look like prayer, time in the word, time in worship, right, time listening to random people talk. Um, that can also, like, look like how we know God more and we spend time with him, right? But also, like, you can enjoy and live in the presence of God with Jesus in your everyday activities. Maybe you go to work, work with God. Maybe you play pickleball, play pickleball with God. Maybe you're just hanging with your friends. Bring God into it. It sounds weird, guys, but this is a crazy, crazy thing that we can do, and it, I promise you it will enrich your life so much, and it will glorify God to the fullest extent, right? Because he is most glorified in us when we're most satisfied in him, okay? So how do y'all do this? I mean, how do we do this? Okay, I, you know, you hear what I'm saying? God is glorified by our enjoyment of him. So if we enjoy him in whatever we're, we're doing, right, we're gonna glorify him. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, you guys have heard this verse. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Great verse, right? Everything can be done to the glory of God. Who knows uh, Stephen Curtis Chapman? Old Christian artist? All right. He has got some bangers, all right? Listen to him. Like, we love, I love that song. But this is one of my favorites. It's called Do Everything, and it's literally just this verse in a song. I don't, know, I don't know if I'm gonna sing it, all right? But you're picking up toys on the living room floor for the 15th time today, matching up socks, sweeping up after Cody. You put a baby on your hip, color on your lip, and head out the door, right? So these are all just random things, random things that you do during the day. You know, some of you, some of you guys, or girls, I mean, put, up, put on makeup, you know, so that's one thing you do every day. Um, some of you guys are matching up socks. Maybe some of you guys have children, um, and you are putting a baby on your hip and getting out the door. But we relate to this, right? The everyday things. So how can the everyday things glorify God? And like, what state of mind do I get into? How do I do this? This next verse, y'all, me and Shane were talking about it yesterday, blew our minds, all right? I don't know how I didn't know this verse. 1 Timothy 4, 5. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. Everything by God. Everything created by God is good. And so, man, that's it. Prayer and thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for what I have. And in that, you can glorify him and experience fullness of joy. And so, you know, I get to thinking, I'm like, okay, if I can do everything to the glory of God, what about, like, sleeping? Can I sleep to the glory of God? If I can do everything right, I ought to sleep to the glory of God. What does that look like? Because, I mean, sleeping, you're not doing anything. You're, you're unconscious, right? How can, you, how can you glorify God in that action? Well, for everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving to prayer. So, I lay down in my bed, and I'm going to be honest with y'all, the first time I did this was last night, all right? I lay down in my bed, and I say, Lord, thank you for allowing me to have rest. Thank you for even creating me to need rest, because it teaches me dependence on you. It teaches me how great you are and how much I need you, right? Thank you for inspiring some guy to, and, or girl, I don't know, to create a mattress and a pillow and a blanket. And y'all, last night this wasn't the case, but over the weekend, I needed my blanket because we didn't have natural gas and our house was so cold. We didn't have any hot water, none of that. And so Lord, thank you for this blanket. Thank you for the mattress that I sleep on. Thank you for letting me be comfortable in my bed. I mean, we, th we just think of these things like, oh yeah, like God is glorified by our thanksgiving. God is glorified by our thankfulness and our taking joy in that moment because we know he gave it to us. A little side note Lane mentioned to me the other day is that this is literally how Boathouse started. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago with Matt. He said, you know, Boathouse started because a guy using his singleness to the advantage of the kingdom. But this is literally how Boathouse started was a guy getting out on his boat and praying to the Lord saying, thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be on the water right now. Thank you for allowing us to have fun and experience your beautiful creation like this and having this boat. First Timothy 4, 5, man, for everything created by God is good. Nothing's to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving and prayer. And so what happened now? We are all here getting to reap the benefit of one man's faithfulness, right? But also the faithfulness of God to glorify himself in our joy. It's crazy. 
It's crazy when you think about this. God wants us to be happy. He does not want you to be miserable. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to be joyful in him. He doesn't want you to seek after all these worthless pleasures. We've discussed them. I don't even need to list them again. He wants you to have the greatest joy that's possible. So we're commanded, we're commanded to live in the joy of Christ, right? And we talked about why we want it, why it's good. So now we've got it. Like, you guys know the secret, all right? Like, we've learned the secret to joy, to fullness of joy. But what is this, if we count Jesus Christ as our supreme treasure, what does this produce in our lives? Do we just get to be happy all the time? Is that it? That can't be it, right? That can't be it. So what treasuring Jesus Christ and delighting in him should produce in our lives is a genuine, and I mean genuine love for all people. All right, I do, I do a bad job at this, okay? People are hard to love sometimes, you know? Some of you guys are probably looking at Brian. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just saw your face. You're the first one I saw. I love Brian. Brian's easy to love most of the time. But anyway, uh, people are hard to love, y'all, because we are sinful and we are, we are broken. And that just shows us we need Jesus more, right? But if, man, if my fullness of joy is in Jesus Christ, and my brother's upsetting me, man. Like, I don't have a brother, but like I'm saying, like my brother, you know, like my homie. He's upsetting me. It's like, my joy ought to overflow in love for him and not, like, not anger. So guys, people, people are most loved by us when our joy overflows. If it's our love coming out, like I'm trying to, man, I'm really trying to love that guy, you're done. Okay, it ain't gonna work out. You're not gonna love him well. But if your joy is found in Christ and that overflows in love, and you're gonna have a great relationship, all right? So um, I gotta tell y'all something, and this is kind of random, okay? I'm kind of a toilet paper snob, all right? Anybody like like Charmin Ultra Soft? All right, come on, come on. Cottonelle, bro? No, don't eat, no. If anyone, hey, as long as you got like more than one ply, we're probably okay. Um, but anyway, I'm a big toilet paper snob, I live with Josiah, Braden, and Will, and they give me crap every time because I'm the one that goes to the store. All right, I go to the store and I get toilet paper for the house, but I'm getting the expensive stuff, all right? It's nice, and they're splitting it with me, all right? Because I bought it, they're splitting it with me. 10 bucks a person, here we go. So, <laughs> long time ago, or actually it wasn't very long ago, it was a couple, couple years ago, during COVID, uh, there, was, there wasn't good toilet paper, all right? There was either toilet paper or leaves. All right, you had one or the other. You didn't have, you didn't get to have the luxury of choosing Charmin, all right? Because what happened was, man, we ran out of all this stuff and people were rushing to the stores. They're like, I gotta get my stuff. I gotta get toilet paper. And for some reason, toilet paper was like the number one item on everyone's list. Maybe they're like me, I don't know. They need the good toilet paper. But my point here is that people were just rushing in as soon as there was a little moment of panic, a little moment of, oh my gosh, I don't have this. Everyone ran and fended for themselves. They forgot about their neighbor. I mean, you guys know what happened during COVID. It was an extremely divisive time. Nobody cared about their neighbor. Nobody cared about loving well. It was all about self and preservation of self. I mean, that's why we didn't go outside for three years. It was because we were worried about getting sick. It was all about preservation of self, guys. And that is not, that is not, and I'm not up here to get controversial, all right? That is not... What the love of God says, that is not what our fullness of joy ought to overflow into. So what does, uh, what does scripture say about this? Let's look, at some, let's look at some scripture. 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 2. Boom. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. All right, so these people in Macedonia, they weren't going through a COVID, all right? They were going through a severe test of affliction, and they're extreme, they had extreme poverty. In the United States, we don't even really have extreme poverty. I don't even think we have that. But they were living in extreme poverty, severe test of affliction, and we, I don't even know what that includes. But what happened? Their abundance of joy overflowed. It reminds me of this, uh, the lady in the Bible that, that gave her like two p pennies or whatever it was called in, in that scripture. And Jesus said, her gift is more blessed than anyone else's because she gave everything she had. 
And so these people, man, they ain't got nothing. They're in extreme poverty. They're in a severe test of affliction. But they got Jesus, and they got fullness of joy in Jesus. And so what did that result in? Abundance of joy and extreme generosity, right? An overflowing of generosity. So, man, that was convicting for me. Because I think, man, my affliction, I don't know what their affliction was. I don't know the details, but it ain't that. All right, mine is easy, right? And so if they love people well, if they had fullness of joy, let us overflow in the same way. Our joy can't be in freedom from, from, from poverty, right? Their, their joy wasn't in freedom from poverty, right? Their, their joy wasn't in, oh, I got this comfort, you know, I, I, I need earthly security. Our joy, you know, like theirs must be in God, right? We can't find our security and our, our, our comfort in a person, right? We can't find it in, in a boyfriend, a girlfriend. We can't find it in, you know, comforting ourselves with, with alcohol or with, you know, wanting to be liked like I've talked about before. Our joy must be placed in Christ, Christ alone. All right, I got one more thing for y'all, one more point. So, if we're overflowing with love and generosity as a result of our joy, we want, we want other people to experience that, right? It can't just be for us, like I've talked about. It can't, be, it can't just be for us. True love, true joy experienced in Christ gives us the absolute impulse to go and bring others in. And like when I say this, guys, know that I'm speaking from my own conviction because like I have lived years of not doing this well. I've lived years of not telling people about Jesus. And honestly, it's probably because I haven't experienced the true joy until just recently. And so if you're, if you're thinking to yourself, man, like I don't really have it. I, I, I'm, I don't ever see myself like sharing the news of Jesus, the joy found in Jesus. And I want you to think. Do you understand it? Do you, do you believe what the Bible says about the joy found in Christ? If you're not leaping out of your seat to go share with somebody, do you even understand, do you even have it yourself? And I'm not trying to make you worried about your salvation here. I'm trying to rile you up for the joy you could be experiencing in Jesus. The Bible says, Psalm 96.3, Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. And we know what Matthew says, great commission, right? Go make disciples of all nations. I even get, man, I, I even get convicted sometimes walking by a random person in Walmart, and I think, man, they might not know the joy of Jesus. And, I, and I, in that moment, I haven't shared, right? I've not done that. Oh, I don't want to stop them. I don't want to. I don't want to interrupt them from the course of their day, right? But what if they're never going to know the joy in Jesus and they're always going to be separated from him? Because we are meant to have this intimate relationship. It's the most important relationship. Perfect intimacy, perfect joy. Go ahead and welcome the band back up. And uh, guys, as I... As this happens, I want to say that truthfully, the only reason, as we're discussing this, the, the only reason that I have this joy and have ever known it is because Jesus spoke through somebody to share the gospel with me. Somebody shared their fullness of joy with me. So the problem here is that some of you, some of you have never surrendered your life to Jesus. Jesus. And if you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus, you're not going to be able to experience the fullness of joy found in him. The fullness of joy that surpasses all, all despair, all bad things happening, all sin. You'll never be able to experience it. Because what the Bible says is that we're all completely depraved. You know, We're all so in sin and we have no way of getting out of it. There's nothing we can do. But what else does the Bible say, man? The free gift of God is eternal life. All right, let's go. Like we get to live forever with our treasure, with our supreme, supreme treasure, Jesus Christ. And so like, man, if you want this joy, man, Romans 10, 9, 
If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Guys, salvation is simple. It's so beautifully simple. But God wants all of you. That's a lot to ask, man. But if you give all of you to him, he gives all of him to you. And you get to experience fullness of joy in him. So, man, you know, during this time, there's always going to be people outside, leaders, um, that would love to discuss with you more about the fullness of joy in Jesus, giving your life to Jesus. I mean, we want nothing more than for you to know Jesus. We want you to know him and we want you to know him the way that we know him. I mean, think about John Piper. I'm just only on the cusp of, you know, studying some of his work. This guy's been doing this for 60 years. He knows Jesus so much and loves him so much. We want your lives to look like this. So always know that invitation never ends. We're always here to talk to you. Give your lives to Jesus. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for your wonderful, wonderful word that tells us who you are. Thank you that we know there is fullness of joy found in you, God. I pray, Lord, for the people in this room that have never experienced your joy. But Lord, they've said, they've said that they know you, Lord, that that they have surrendered their lives before you, Lord, but they are not living to glorify you most and be satisfied in you, Lord. Let them be satisfied in you. Let them know you to the fullest extent, Lord. Reveal yourself to all of us. God, I just pray that you would save the non-believer in this room. Reveal yourself and all your beauty and splendor to them now. And thank you for your love, Lord. Thank you that we get to share intimacy with the God that created us and created the universe. May I always wonder at that fact. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.